Bueno, buenas tardes, Teresa. Buenas eh, tardes. <ríe> encantado de tenerte aquí hoy en una nueva grabación de Yo en Jairo Café, que como ya sabéis los que nos veis, eh, este año ya no hay presentaciones en directo, sino que van a ser o charlas así o vídeos que los participantes nos envíen. Y nada, pues cuéntanos un poco qué estás haciendo ahora, dónde estás y qué habías estudiado antes de, de tu doctorado. Sí, pues me llamo Teresa Baraza, soy geóloga, hice la de geología en la Universidad de Barcelona y cuando, termi cuando terminé el grado pues quería continuar con los estudios y me interesaba mucho el medio ambiente y también me interesaba venir a Estados Unidos para cambiar y ver otros, en otros um, sistemas, cómo funcionan. Así que vine a Estados Unidos, um, hice máster en geología medioambiental y luego me gustaba mucho el laboratorio en el que estaba, así que me decidí quedar para hacer un doctorado también. Y ahora estoy viviendo en San Luis, en Missouri, que está en el Midwest, un poco en el medio de Estados Unidos, en uh -huh. St. Louis University. Bueno, ¿y el tema que nos vas a contar hoy lo has decidido tú? ¿Es parte de un proyecto? Sí, pues el... hoy voy a hablar un poquito sobre dos de los capítulos de mi doctorado, que son um, un poco de lección mía, porque estaba interesada en, en microplásticos y en... Y en aguas subterráneas, así que diseñé dos proyectos um, un poco um, para estudiar microplásticos en, en, en aguas subterráneas. Vale, pues bueno, cuando quieras nos puedes contar tu presentación. Vale, necesitaré permiso para compartir la pantalla. Sí. Um, me la tendrás que dar con, con, porque tú eres el host el, sí, y ¿no? me tendrás que dar permiso. No me deja de momento. ¿Qué no te ves? Pero claro, a mí sí me deja, pero aquí no tiene. Me voy a poner como. Si me pones como cojo esto, host, entonces sí que me dejará. A ver. Hacer anfitrión. Ahora sí. Ahora, ahora sí. Perfecto. Uh, pues lo tengo. Ahora. Uh -huh. ¿Veis mi pantalla? Sí. Vale, perfecto. Um, voy a cambiar al inglés para, para hacer la presentación un poco más uh, accesible para la gente y porque también estoy más acostumbrada a hablar en inglés sobre mi, mi investigación. Um, ok, hello. Uh, so today, like I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about two of my PhD projects to focus on understanding how urbanization and flooding enhance microplastic pollution in karst aquifers. Um, These are two sort of independent but connected projects that are part of my PhD, and they are partially funded by the Cave Research Foundation, the Missouri Research Research, Research Missouri Water Research 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 Center, the USGS, and the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. So the first concept I want to introduce today are microplastics, which are emerging contaminants that are very pervasive in the environment. And that means that they can be found in virtually all environments on our planet. Uh, microplastics are defined as pieces of plastic that are less than five millimeters in diameter. And due to their small size and the plastic polymer itself, they're very durable and highly mobile, meaning that they can travel long distances and they remain in the environment for long periods of time. Um, microplastics can be primary if they are produced small, like microfibers, or they can be secondary if they are formed by the degradation of larger pieces of plastic. Microplastics can also be hazardous when they are ingested. Um, and here we have some examples on the uh, right top corner of the screen um, of organisms that have ingested microplastics, and they can be hazardous either to the physical presence of the plastic in the organisms, and they can cause suffocation or satiation, or they can be toxic due to other, part other substances that travel adsorbed on the surface of the plastic. So microplastic research has uh, mainly focused on marine environments. Um, and like we see in this diagram here, the trends in research go from marine environments to terrestrial environments. And more recently, we have had more research focused on terrestrial environments, such as freshwater, agricultural fields, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, this research has demonstrated that um, most microplastics are indeed land sourced, meaning that they are um, transported from terrestrial environments to marine environments. And this is not 
very surprising because terrestrial environments is where plastic is produced, used, and discarded. Um, however, like I mentioned, um, most research is focused in marine environments, and now recently we are moving towards terrestrial environments. And one of those terrestrial environments that is highly understudied is groundwater. And there is not a lot of research focused in groundwater, um, and more specifically, cars, like I will mention in a second. So, like we all probably know here, karst aquifers are characterized by the presence of dissolution features uh, such as sinkholes, conduits, et cetera, that cause this very high connectivity to, between the surface and the subsurface. And this very unique architecture makes karst aquifers in karst environments very susceptible to surface contamination. However, like I mentioned, microplastic pollution in karst is highly understudied. Um, there has been a couple of papers that have suggested ways in which microplastics can enter groundwater and specifically karst aquifers. And here we have a diagram uh, that shows that dolines or sinkholes can act as entry points of microplastics into the karst and springs can act as uh, kind of export points of these plastics into the car uh, out of the karst. And then we have other uh, mechanisms of introduction of plastic to the groundwater, such as just percolation through the soil or groundwater surface water exchange in high free zones, et cetera. However, this is kind of just a conceptual model. We're still lacking field um, studies that investigate this phenomenon. And this is what my research comes in, where I'm trying to understand how these microplastics are entering and moving through car systems and how urbanization and flooding conditions are impacting microplastic pollution in cars. So my research area is located in St. Louis and Missouri in the United States. And um, as you can see here, it's kind of in the middle, in the Midwest, uh, located near Chicago and located at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. Um, the purple color indicates karst topography. So you can see that Missouri has a lot of karst and we also have very large urban hubs. So the combination of karst plus people makes St. Louis a very uh, kind of ideal place to investigate uh, anthropogenic impacts into karst. So as you can see, my question kind of has two uh, different aspects, urbanization and flooding. And like I said, these are is a combination of two projects that I will be talking about. So the first one is to understand the impact of ur urbanization on microplastic pollution in karst. And to investigate that, I selected 10 spring sites located near St. Louis. This is land use land cover map where red is urbanized and green and yellow is more forest and agricultural land use. Um, and as you can see, I selected 10 springs in these white circles that are located in a gradient of urbanization from very urban near St. Louis city and gradient out towards more forested and agricultural areas uh, in the state. Um, so I collected, today I'll be talking about samples from February and April 2022 during base low conditions. And I will also be talking about um, one set of surface water samples that I collected from uh, surface water features that feed into the karst for seven of these specific sites. Because like I said, I wanted to investigate how surface and groundwater are connected. Now, to understand how hydrology or flooding conditions impact plastic in karst, I selected one of the sites, Cliff Case Spring, which is also located near St. Louis, so it's um, moderately urban. And I collected weekly samples as well as high frequency samples in for a year. High frequency samples meaning uh, samples every 30 minutes or so during four flooding events. So I could understand how microplastics are moving uh, during those high flow events. So jumping right on to results, um, what I can confirm now is that suspected microplastics were found in almost all my spatial samples. So all those 10 springs had microplastics in them, um, as well as surface waters as well. Um, and if, you, if we look at the median amounts of microplastics in springs and surface waters, we see that they're very similar. However, if we look at maximum amounts, we see that microplastics in the springs were much higher than in surface waters, and we're still investigating that. Now, if we look at microplastic characteristics, which is 
um, the morphology of, morphology of the plastic, the color of the plastics and the size of the plastic, which are characteristics that are very commonly reported in microplastic research. We see that both in spring and surface waters, the most common type of plastics were microfibers. And we have some examples at the bottom there of different microfibers that I found. The most common color was clear and the most common size, the size was kind of distributed normally. And the most common sizes were, found, were in between 250 and 1,000 micrometers in size. So it was interesting to see that the characteristics in the amounts of plastics were similar in both spring waters and surface waters. Now, like I said, I wanted to see how urbanization was impacting this plastics amounts. So what I did was I took the microplastics that I found in each of the springs and I normalized them by a, the recharge area of the spring to get an idea of how much plastic is being transported by unit of drainage area, basically. And I plotted that against percent urbanization in the recharge area. And I did see a positive and significant correlation between urbanization and microplastics. And this observation kind of confirms my hypothesis that urbanization is uh, introducing more plastics into the groundwater. Now, the last aspect I wanted to investigate was how surface waters and groundwaters are related. So I took the seven sites where I had sampled surface water and I paired them up with groundwater. So I have pairs of spring and surface waters. And then I ranked them in order from least urban uh, on this 4% to most urban here. And what I found was that I um, we have some sort of threshold in which for um, very rural sites, like these four here, we see higher amounts of plastics in springs, whereas in more urban sites, we see a higher amounts of plastics or similar amounts of plastics in surface waters to the springs. Um, and this is an ongoing data set. I'm still running samples, but our uh, current hypothesis is that in groundwater, since we have higher retention times, uh, we could be seeing an accumulation of plastic in the groundwater that leads to this higher amount of plastic being discharged out into springs. And in um, rural spring, in rural systems, this is very visible because we have an overall less contamination in the surface. But in urban systems where we have a lot more littering and trash, uh, we are seeing higher amounts of microplastics in um, surface systems. And therefore, this effect is kind of um, not as visible. So we have seen how urbanization is impacting microplastic in cars. Now let's change gears to see how hydrology or flooding conditions impact microplastics in cars. And to do that, like I mentioned, I took high frequency samples from Cliff Cave Spring. Um, here we have a picture of Cliff Cave Spring during a flood, uh, flooding event. Um, and I looked at how plastics were evolving throughout the flood. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about specifically one of the floods, which was kind of the largest flood, um, more obvious to talk about, uh, which was a flood in October 2020. And this plot on the left shows the hydrograph of the flood, as well as the amount of suspected microplastics that I saw. And what first thing we can see is that there is an increase of microplastic amounts um, right during or slightly after the flood peak, kind of confirming that floods are increasing the amount of microplastics that are moving, moving through the karst at that time. Um, now, to confirm the presence of plastics, we analyzed a subset of those microparticles on FTIR to get the material type. And um, this plot here, I separated base flow conditions and high flow conditions. And what I found is that whereas while um, cellulose materials, which are technically not plastics, they're cellulosic. Um, that doesn't mean that they cannot be anthropogenic because cellulose is cotton and a lot of our clothes are made of cotton. Um, cellulose materials dominated the response both at base low and high flow conditions. We did see an increase in the amount and the variability of plastic polymers during high flow compared to base flow. So um, this analysis of material type kind of confirmed that flooding events or high flow events are indeed increasing the transport as well as the variability of microplastics that we are seeing during flooding events in, cars, in, a, in this specific car system. 
Now, in more detail, I mentioned I had sampled four flooding events. So this plot on the left is showing the distribution of material types throughout those four flooding events, September, October, November, and December. And we see that the distribution um, is pretty similar, um, but there are some differences in the floods in October and November. And those indeed were the largest floods um, that we sampled. Um, and I really don't have much time to go into detail, but we're working on the, on the draft for this manuscript. So stay tuned if you're interested. Um, and uh, lastly, for the October flood, which I just talked about in the last slide, we also analyzed material types throughout the flood to see how they were evolving um, through the hydrograph. And we did see that right at uh, flood peak and right after flood peak, we did see um, this differences in polymer types um, indicating that there could be differences in plastic transport uh, depending on the timing of the flood and the timing of the flood peak. So in summary, uh, my research has confirmed that microplastic contamination is including karst groundwater systems, um, meaning that they could become a threat to the ecosystem and the water resources. Um, more specifically, I've, I, my data show that urbanization um, indeed in causes an increase in microfibers in karst, and that longer retention times in groundwater lead to an apparent higher amount of microplastics in springs compared to surface waters. Whereas in, in urban areas, surface waters have just overall more contamination and this effect is kind of tapered down. And in terms of hydrology, uh, my study at Cliff Cave confirmed that uh, flooding events indeed enhance the transport of microplastics in this karst environment. And that polymer types, while they were similar among flood peaks, there were some differences that could be due to the timing of the hydrograph and the timing and the magnitude of the flood peak. And with that, I will take questions or you can contact me via email. Bueno, muchas gracias Teresa por tu presentación. Creo que puedes, si quieres, dejar de compartir. Vale. Uh, stop share. Vale. Que ha estado muy interesante. Yo no sabía o sea, la, la realidad.